that's kind of an awkward setup just because of court management, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, we tried to kind of split it so you can look at us and look at the projection as well. Um, I want to just first, yeah, start off by acknowledging this beautiful place and each other. Thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday. And um, thank you to Andrea Poli and Sire Santa Fe for allowing us to be a part of this rad collaboration. And um, yeah, we're really excited to step into this world. Um, so we're going to both introduce ourselves and our work, but just starting off, I'm Caitlin Brayson. I'm Shane Coffin. And our piece is right here. Um, and yeah, we're going to be giving a little bit of background information and then sort of at the end we'll talk about that. Is that Cloud Storia over there? It is. Okay. Yes. We also have some capacities around. If you want, you can come look at them afterwards, but there's some um, cultures of them. And this is like a little test <laughs> mock up baby t shirt div. Um, just seeing how it would grow on linen. Okay. I will have time for questions at the end, but I'm also very happy to, like, if anyone has a question or wants to interrupt, I'm, I'm happy personally to have things be conversational. So, um, yeah, I'll say that. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to give a little bit of introduction about ourselves. Um, we're going to talk about fungi and specifically the, the species that we're working with, Cladosporium cladus varieties. Um, Say it again. Cladosporium cladus varieties. Thank you. Oh, and it was sporiorites. Sporiorites. Then, yeah, we're going to talk about sort of where this work and research, research came from, um, kind of how it started with the collaborator that I'm working with, Sasha Spachal. Um, who's a Slovenian post-media artist. And then we're going to talk about the work, um, the discussion of the artwork and kind of our research trajectory. Okay. That's me. Um, so I am a, I'm an environmental and bio artist. Um, I graduated from the art and ecology program at UNM in 2018, and um, at UNM I was concurrently studying mycology and art, and I was researching ecotoxicology, so how, basically bio and microremediation, and how those yeah. worlds can be synthesized through artworks, through public works, um, and I work primarily with fungi, but I also work with plants um, and microbes, and I'm very interested in all of my artworks decaying, um, so I tend to not really have many things left over after a project, which is my intention because I don't really want to make more waste in the world. Um, I want to actually feed living systems. Um, but I also work, yeah, I work in a variety of media, so I'm going to kind of just show a couple projects um, and talk about them pretty briefly. Sorry about the color on the projector. Um, this one is called Many Hands, and for this work I collaborated with a dear friend, Beata Sosa Pena, who, um, and Tewa Women United and the Red Nation, um, on a environmental justice and remediation project that was kind of spanning a year long. And we were really looking at um, a site where there had been a fracking flowback spill in 2019 that basically got... Um, completely brushed under the rug, as many things tend to happen out in the um, oil and gas world in Navajo Nation. Um, and for this project, we we basically built this terraced garden um, that incorporated many different types of living organisms. Um, but the sort of premise of it was these hands, these mycelial hands that were growing um, basically throughout all of 2020. One, um, from a series of workshops that we did all, all around Navajo Nation. Um, and eventually those hands came back together and we created a waddle, so like an erosion control device um, with, with many hands that when the water would pass through would be filtered um, through the hands, so the hands of the people as well as through the other living organisms on site. Um, <coughs> 
some a current project I'm working on right now that really is like very much in process. So I really just have images kind of of, of the process of it um, rather than like what's the product of it. Um, and for this work, I was really fortunate to receive um, the Anonymous Muslim Woman Environmental Arts Grant last year um, to fund research and um, yeah, artwork that was really focused on the burn star from the Hermit's Peak and Cap Canyon wildfires last year. Um, so these are just some process images of collecting data, um, so some soil data, also we're doing sound work, um, and then that, uh, the image on the right is actually a drum image of the fire damage. Um, but what's really kind of happening with the work is that um, I am working within an organization, grassroots organization in Las Vegas, New Mexico, called Neighbors Helping Neighbors, and um, posting these story circles where people who are impacted from the fires um, come to the story circle. They're sharing their experiences of the fires, um, of memories of their land, and what was lost um, in exchange for, very, for resources and um, uh, assistance. And like labor assistance basically, and then their stories are going to be embroidered onto this very large scale quilt that's going to be akin to kind of what's growing here, um, where there's going to be beneficial microbes and um, supplemental organisms that will be planted with um, native saplings in a kind of reforestation experiment. Um, so it's like, kind of hard to talk about this work because like I said, it's very much in process, but there will be some kind of culminating events um, this summer. And just to get, kind of show a spectrum, I also do um, sculpture and video work, um, projection mapping, and um, yeah, this is just an example of, this artwork was really kind of trying to bring to life, like to human scale, um, the mycorrhizal systems that exist below ground in the soil um, and connect multiple species of trees together. Um, and so there was this very large scale kind of super 3D weaving um, that was made in between multiple species of trees at the UCLA Botanical Garden. And then at night it was illuminated with um, 3D animation that was made by Matea Friend and um, those were looking at kind of what are these communications, like what is this electrochemical communication that's happening between multiple species, um, be it fungi or tree or bacteria, that they're all kind of collaborating together and actually talking. Um, so, yes, I'm going to stop there and move, and Shane's going to pick it up. So hi everyone, I'm a PhD uh, graduate. I just graduated from the University of Michigan in applied physics, and I currently work at Los Alamos National Labs. And uh, briefly what I'll talk about are three kind of overarching themes to my work as a PhD student, and even slightly before as a post back after I finished my bachelor at New Mexico Tech in physics and math. So the first thing I've studied this is at the University of Michigan. Uh, there's this very simple formula, really, truly simple, uh, for making a universe. And really what you need is, you, it, it, trust me, it, it's, it's, it's really as simple as I'm gonna describe. You need mass and you need gravity. What I'm showing here is what happens if you just take mass and scatter it all throughout the universe, just fill space with mass, just sprinkle it everywhere with no direction, no unif just uniformly everywhere. And eventually, after you turn gravity on, this mass starts coalescing that gravity. So what we're looking at here is dark areas are where there's no mass, and the light areas are where mass is starting to form. And this is done by a... Uh, uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Doesn't mass have, um, doesn't mass entail gravity? I mean, isn't gravity connected to mass? Of course, of course, okay. yeah. Um, I think, yeah, for simplicity here, I like to, I like to view them as, as, as kind of entangled. They are, they are related by, uh, you know, so-called gauge theory, but, 
uh, for sake of argument here. For the thought experiment. For the thought experiment. <laughs> so yeah, think, you can think of the gravity as any other attractive force like magnetism or something. This is the background radiation. Uh, no, but uh, not, not unrelated. Mm -hmm. Not unrelated, but no, this isn't, this isn't strictly uh, like background radiation. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a thing here, but that's sort of like leftover from the Big Bang. Here what I'm just talking about is how mass comes together okay. to like form galaxies. And that's exactly what I'm showing in this picture. So that bright center, and uh, again, this, this image is representing a space unfathomably large. I, I, you know, I could tell you that it's in the megaparsecs, but even I don't have a good grasp of sometimes the sense of time and scale. But, so we have these, these, this network, and in a way it's very, like, very much like a mycelium. It's, it, you, might, you might see this image without a caption, and you might think, is this cosmology, the universe? Is this uh, neurons in the brain? Or is this a mycelial network? It's, it's, it's all incredibly related. But what I researched in, in this project at the University of Michigan is how exactly these highways feed galaxies. Because at some point, say 100 million years after the Big Bang, in the darkest of a cosmic night, a star ignited. And that was the very first light in the universe. And so by helping understand how galaxies get fed, we understand how inside a galaxy, stars can form, and so on and so forth. What's even more remarkable to me is that we have facilities on this planet. Here I'm showing an image of the National Ignition Facility. And what this facility, this multi-billion dollar facility does, is it takes 192 lasers, and in the blink of an eye, truly orders faster than the blink of an eye. We're talking millions of a second. Where's that facility? This is in Livermore, California. Uh, so in less than a blink of an eye, all these lasers converge on a target that is no larger than, say, the size of an of a eraser on a pencil. And uh, in one instant, we use roughly a thousand times more power than the entire United States does in an in instant. And we create this plasma to try and fuse like stars do. So this is also... Uh, tangential to work that I've done in a field called uh, laboratory astrophysics. So we're trying to make star stuff in the laboratory. We're trying to study astrophysics in the laboratory. So here's like kind of an image of this crazy configuration. You can see that ball, which is the, the chamber, and all of these, these laser beams kind of just coalescing on the center. What kind of laser? Or lasers in 192. Lasers? Yeah, what kind of laser? Oh, like in optical wavelength? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not actually sure which kind they use. Yeah. Um, High energy. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think they might be argon neon. Or blue, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not actually sure. Because I, I, I do the design and theory work, so I start from the optical. I, I don't ever go this far but to, to help explain the picture. Uh, um, so now I actually researched something completely different as a postdoc. This is an image of a computer model of tsunami uh, outside of Indonesia, and this was done, I believe, a few years ago. But the tsunami occurred in 2018. And uh, the reason why I kind of bring all of these up is because, you know, as a physicist, there is a language that describes all of these phenomena. And there's a reason why I, in particular, as a so-called fluid dynamicist, have the capacity to study all these uh, different, seemingly disparate phenomena. And that's fundamentally because of these equations right here. And I won't go into too much detail here, but it's hard to see the beauty in this crazy system. There's three equations here with so many terms, and this is actually a simplified model. But there is a very, very deep elegance, a very deep beauty in these equations. 
when you start to learn this language. And for me, even as a scientist, I'm still wowed and completely in awe that these describe our physical world. And to me, this really <coughs> is poetry. And of course, poets already know that mathematics is its own poetry. Here's an excerpt from Wyslava Szymborska talking about uh, the number pi and um, recognizing that in the number pi, for example, is literally every number that could ever exist because it is infinite and non-repeating. And there's just, because, you know, of course, pi is just so fundamental to anything circular, the motion of the planets, <coughs> wave motion, it's fundamental to our existence, quantum mechanics, everything. Um, it's, it, it really is <coughs> art. It is, to me, mathematics, in a way, is art. And here's a piece that I constructed as an artist. Um, I'm also a newer artist. This is from Currents last year. And here I'm using metal rotators, uh, rotating discs. They're just uh, sheet metal with a window cut out, and behind them a light. When they pass by the light, they turn on the light. And this piece sort of uh, is meant to study that in the hopes of watching this, you might wish that all the lights would come on at once. But realistically, they rarely, rarely, rarely do. So you could stare at it for hours and hope that they would come on when they were here. So for all the lights to come on at once, they'd all have to be in perfect sync. Perfect sync, one. yeah. <coughs> this piece is called Synchrony, just for that. So it, is it when the, that white thing is pointing directly up? That's right. Yeah, it'll light that. It'll turn on that light behind. Is that random then? Do you have that sort Well, so they're all, in this piece, they're actually all, uh, like, attempted to be co-timed, I can't remember, roughly around, like, uh, 20 RPM or less or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's less. It's like 18 RPM. But just with that little variation, even around 18 RPM, by hand-tuning them with that little variation, it still becomes an impossibility. It's just relatively possibility to go. Sorry about that. Does it have a mouse on? <clears throat> that they digest 
and metabolize nutrients like we do. So they're heterotrophic, which means that they absorb, dissolve molecules um, through their bodies. And rather than having a stomach on the inside of their body, it's actually on the outside of their body. Um, their mycelia, which is their sort of um, their cell structure, is actually like basically has all these enzymes and kind of like stomach acids like on the outside of their skin. So as they grow through the world, they come in contact with certain objects or trees or leaves, and they just kind of make that their home. And then as they're making it their home, they're absorbing those nutrients into their body. Um, another huge classification is that they do not photosynthesize. However, this is becoming increasingly challenged um, in, in a variety of ways. One way we're going to talk about um, with radiosynthesis, um, but also fungi live within plants, and actually they were the first root systems. They were how plants were able to move on to the terrarian um, land, and how they were able to kind of establish root roots, basically. And so because of that, there are over 94% or something like that of all plant life on Earth actually have these have fungi living inside of them in every capacity, in their leaves, in their roots, um, in their vascular systems. And um, so in a way, they're kind of, they're not photosynthesizing, but they're coordinating with their plant host to receive those carbons and sugars that are being derived from photosynthetic processes. Um, the fungi that we're looking at and talking about um, is a part of this kind of small sect of very strange um, fungi who are actually radiotropic, which means that they can synthesize radiation in their bodies like a plant would synthesize um, photons in their body. So they're chemically transforming that. So this is again like why they're totally challenging our hegemonic and taxonomic systems that we humans have have delineated for them, and they're like, yeah, actually I behave differently in every environment that I'm in. So sometimes I can feed on plant matter, sometimes I might be living within a plant, and I might be um, mycorrhizal in that I'm synthesizing with that plant, and other times I actually can live in a highly radioactive environment and transform that radiation into food. Um, Cladosporidium is also a genus that's super ubiquitous, so it's actually in the air, that it's in, the spores are in the air right now. Um, it is the common, one of the common black holes that you would see growing in your house, or I just found some black hole in my fridge, <laughs> or just like I, I saw some, and I'm pretty sure it's Cladosporidium. Um, it's basically everywhere, they're super ubiquitous, and they're actually some of the Earth's oldest organisms. Um, their, their spores have been found in fossil records from the Crustaceous period, um, which is when the Earth's uh, atmosphere was highly radioactive because it's when the poles shifted. Um, and so there's evidence that these were some of the kind of key organisms that were actually helping transform our, our atmosphere um, into something that was livable for plants and then plants obviously produce oxygen so there's this kind of like they're very much um, a species that was really kind of paving the way for life um, yeah do you want to sure. we're just kind of switching back and forth so. so the world of science has taken interest in these fungi as well um, I believe in roughly 1970 or so uh, is when scientists first discovered that a variety of fungi, radiotrophic fungi as Caitlin described, fungi that can not only withstand radiation, but that can feed and thrive, synthesize from radiation an energy source, much like photosynthesis, but not photosynthesis. So in yeah, roughly 1970s, Chernobyl was host to a number of 86. 86, sorry, uh, a number of uh, fungi that were they're growing, and one of them happened to be a common black mold of the uh, class forest variety, right? And I believe there was Aspergillus and some others. But uh, uh, in 2018, I believe 
uh, NASA actually put this stuff on a satellite, sent it to space, and studied how well radiotropic fungi would uh, withstand and potentially thrive in the harsh radiation environment of space. And much like uh, one of the petri dishes, you know, right on the pedestal, uh, in a similar method, that's, that's what they did. They put it in a petri dish, they put it in space with a window exposed to space, and then when it came back, they took their you know, data and found that it did thrive. And over time, the radiation would melanize. I bought through, through synthesis, radiosynthesis, it would melanize the fungi, it would turn darker. And this actually promoted even better absorption of radiation and thereby better radiosynthesis. So this crazy idea emerges, can we use uh, radiotropic fungi as radiation shielding? Uh, it's cheap, it uh, yeah, grows everywhere, like Caitlin said, in your homes. You know, it's, it's probably there now, um, unless you can very well. But um, yeah, so, so that is part of what seeded uh, some interest in, in this research. And even as recent as last year, this is a this is a headline of a paper from July of 2022, performed at none other than Sandia National Labs right here in New Mexico. <coughs> and what they did was, uh, in a very systematic way, categorize the types of radiation that this same species that we're using, the Cloudus varieties, and another one. Uh, 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 in addition to cladus varieties, they studied how well these fungi would radiosynthesize. And uh, I just think that's really cool that it's still a very active field of research, it's brand new, and uh, there's some really interesting things that we don't understand about this fungus. There's so much we don't understand. <laughs> um, so, this work kind of um, came from this, there's a few things. So I, so Sasha Spachal, the artist that I was talking about, y'all should check out her work because it's amazing. Um, she and I have been working, I've been working on a project with her that's called Mycomythologies. And there's various app, like, uh, iterations of this project. One of the iterations was that we sort of taught, um, we taught workshops all throughout 2020 and 2021, like around the world, on Zoom, obviously. Um, that were kind of really trying to facilitate students thinking about forming new mythologies that would facilitate kind of this speculative future and like how could we work within the model of fungi um, as these very, um, you know, they thrive on decay, they're these ever-changing species, they totally evade, like I was talking about, all these boundaries. Um, and they're pervasive and they're vital, they're vital to every aspect of life on Earth, but how can we use those sort of their biological lifestyles as models for creating new mythologies that might lead us into a more sustainable future. Um, and from that, we, we had this whole database of student stories that we put, uh, that we called Spawn, and um, we applied to um, write a story for Antenna Magazine, the, nature, well, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture magazine, um, and we went about writing a speculative fiction sci-fi story, which is like totally not my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, but, and we, we integrated um, some of our students' um, stories, some of the myths that they came up with. And this, <laughs> it was a very crazy story, but it's kind of the way we sort of figured out how to intertwine everything is we, our main character, Shiro, um, which is, a white mass, it's Japanese for a white mass, and it's also sometimes what mycelial networks are called. Um, but our main character dies right away, and the whole story is set in the decomposition of her body. And as she's being, as all of her, her body is being metabolized by many species, all of her memories are kind of escaping into the network, escaping into the world around her. And one of those stories, um, was from a Belarusian artist, um, and our yeah, this very sweet 
um, student, Hannah, and she had all these stories about living in Belarus and harvesting mushrooms um, near the exclusion zone with her family. And um, it was sort of through working with Hannah that we learned about the radiotropic fungi and kind of what spawned this whole idea that we started researching um, for the next year. And we were you know, very interested in this idea of the shielding capacity of these organisms. And um, <clears throat> so this is an ongoing project that we showed last year in, in Ljubljana, in Slovenia. Um, but we created this whole fungarium. So there's, there's pages of, there's a, there's a fungarium book like you would kind of see in like an herbarium where you can, you see the species information and there's kind of, yeah, just information about where they grow and their lifestyles and when they were found. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's also, <coughs> hello, <laughs> what's that, <Hello>. dog? <laughs> um, okay. But then we were also interested in kind of integrating it into these, um, yeah, into like an actual shield. And there's kind of a whole story about this, of course, because everything that Sasha and do together kind of creates this huge mythological narrative. So we were actually looking at how these organisms might provide shields for people who have been affected by radiation um, throughout the history of its sort of human discovery, um, from Marie Curie to um, the Navajo miners. And so it's kind of this whole broad spectrum of, of looking at these stories of people who have been um, really badly affected by it, um, while also acknowledging its potential for um, yeah, well, A, it's ubiquity within every aspect of our life, radiation thinking, and also um, kind of the, the, the potential of working with it. Um, okay. So, with all that discussion led to our peace. In our collaboration. In our collaboration, yeah. And I'm just going to let this run in the back right for a while. Just one second. Okay, there it is. So, this is a visualization that we created for our piece. Uh, really discussing a lot of what we just went over. Uh, namely that we're interested in this species of fungi. We're interested in collaborating with it because we can't survive radiation, but not only can this fungi survive radiation, but it can flourish. And with the mention of using it as shielding, uh, we talk about a hypothetical reality in which we may need to cooperate with fungi. And the species that already grows in our home, um, already readily available, and very much in our space, in our reality, uh, can we can work with it. And so mutualism, specifically this piece, and, and, and by the way, it's, it's, uh, it's right over there to your right, and if you want to refer to it visually while I'm uh, discussing it. Um, kind of with the piece here, what we're looking at is a window. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in our piece of uh, this sort of like stained glass. Uh, uh, Caitlin had, had sewn together this, this piece uh, using a technique called Pugaji, which is a quilting technique. Um, and it very much resembles a stained glass, but here we were thinking, maybe visualizing it as a curtain. Um, and the fungi is growing on this curtain, and in a potential harsh reality, uh, it's not. It's not absurd in our in our in our uh, micro mythology, so to speak, using Caitlin's language, uh, that we might exist and actually desire a future with them. And in this visual visualization, I go a little bit over how you know this this sort of this sort of role in cladus varieties uh, uh, with with radiation, how how radiosynthesis kind of works. And uh, just, yeah, just sort of visualizing what we think uh, at the very least is happening. And our piece does not actually use radiation, that's just a Home Depot light, um, so don't worry about it. 
But uh, in the future, clearly these are avenues that we want to investigate. Um, so what you're witnessing here is sort of the be beginning of uh, potentially new uh, narrative. Is the darkening making them more effective? That's the melanization. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, or, I mean, it, of course, I mean, melanin is a pigment that protects radiation, or so protects UV radiation, yeah, so it's the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah, these, these mycelia are, like, so metal. So are they becoming more tolerant, or you call them trophic, you know, so att attracted to, so they're not uh, phagic, they're not eating it, right? They're they not are, using, yeah. They they're are eating, eating it, or they're just resisting? They're eating no, they're eating it. it. They're resisting and... and through the, through the process, again, like, so I like to, I mean, fungi are organisms that live within their food. So they, no matter what, basically, like, any environment that they're in is also, it's simultaneously their home and food. And so radiation or radio, radioactive environments are no different than that. So the ones that were found in the, they're, like, found on the walls in reactor four, which is one of the most radioactive parts of, from the Chernobyl disaster, and they're, they're not necessarily, yeah, they're not eating what's on the wall. Um, they're eating, actually they're going towards radiation and they're synthesizing it in their bodies. Do we know what that mechanism is? It's very complex, but melanin is, an just like chlorophyll is an essential pigment in the process of photosynthesis, melanin is an essential pigment in the process of radiosynthesis. But like, I mean, those papers that, it, that Shane was talking about, within the, I mean, since 2018, it's like, there's been kind of a full force on like what is going on and how are they, how is this process happening? And so if you can read some papers that are kind of um, sort of speculating or studying it, but like it's not, I don't think that there's like a sure understanding of how, even in the same way that there's not really like a super solid understanding of how exactly photosynthesis works. Is there any proof, even though I know radiation has a long half-life, but that if there's rooms in Chernobyl with this fungi growing that lowers the amount of radiation? Yeah, is it, is there's, it? I mean, there, I, I don't know if they're measuring, they're just kind of like, it, again, in the process, I don't know if they've done like measures of an entire room or like how even that would necessarily mm -hmm. be, be measured. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't make less radiation, it just eats the radiation. So we can't we can't yeah. necessarily use it to say reduce the amount of radiation that uh, radioactive substance so not produces. But again, like we're kind of speculating, and with Sasha too, like we're speculating that like if you were to stand behind that, or if it was like a window of your house, or if you're wearing it as a clothing, then it's like it's shielding you from the amount of radiation that your body is receiving. What do you think of you know, scaling it? You know, there's a little bit of black mold in it. Our valley going, and this is how you can hear it. Somewhere in Chernobyl, mm -hmm. walls, buildings that's a lot of that. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people you know, having to survive that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so what's interesting to you is yeah. that I mean, yeah, that's a huge point of this conversation. And actually, I'll play the next thing because yes. so with Sasha, I, we were we were speculating when we were kind of working on our um, on our ideas for what we were going to make. Um, I'm really interested in textiles. I mean, most of like what I do is essentially making some kind of textile piece that is simultaneously habitat for fungi. And so immediately it was like, yeah, like we, let's make clothing. And, and then it became very problematic because these are <laughs> species that are asthmatic and like actually have, um, I mean, some of, some of them that actually are in Chernobyl are like extremely deadly. Um, to humans, and like this one species, Wagella, is actually like it, it causes meningitis. Um, and so, the yeah, again, like the sort of speculation is just like, well, how okay, so how would we design something, first of all, like, and could we? Um, and second, like, which species could we work with? Which Clado is a very the genus is like. It's, you know, you don't want to be like huffing it, but it's also, it is ubiquitous. It's already present in every aspect of our life. Um, but also, like, could there be these ways that we kind of create these, um, like, symbiotic patches? Or, kind of, like, we're, we're just really dreaming of this idea. And, and that's sort of where Shane and I are at with it as well. Like, how could this be applied? But what I also wanted to say is that, <clears throat> very interestingly, in the presence of, 
um, radiation, certain species, Clado being one of them, actually turn off pathogenic genes. So they're not, so that it's like they're actually, and like I said, these are some of the oldest organisms on our planet. Um, so there's, again, this sort of speculation that like, well, they're actually maybe just doing, they're eating what they've, what they were kind of born to eat. And so in that process, it, like, would it shift off or turn off those genes that are harmful to us? If they were in like a substantial presence of radiation, like would they actually be, um, you know, cause allergens and everything? That's like totally just speculation. So I don't, that's, there's like no science on my end there. It's just kind of like a thought. Um, but yeah, so, um, So Shane and I are working together because, um, yeah, I mean, I think you can see the synthesis there, um, and we're kind of just considering how we might, um, you know, I'm personally interested, I guess I'll just go to the next slide, um, I'm super interested in testing this, like I want to know, <laughs> be able to measure, um, can we, yeah, like what is, what is the data, like are we actually, um, creating these little baby t-shirts or something that, like, could, that are shielding radiation, like could we somehow um, do that? And we don't have a lab or money or anything, so <laughs> it's kind of just purely speculative. And Sasha's also working on other aspects of this as well, in Slovenia, and so there's, it's kind of this whole, yeah. It reminds me of aspects of research in the military industrial complex where they're doing extended biological skins say for people in the war zones where they can inject, you know, uh, blood or whatever if someone's injured. That's right. There's an extended skin of the body. So curious if you want to approach, you know, one of these places to see if they might have a residual skin. Yeah, it's interesting. So you have this, what I'm hearing is, like if the clado, you're saying that this is the most important part, you say the clado, when it gets melanized, turns off pathogenic other things about it, like the mold that runs from the mold. So that seems to me in the mytho realm of our huge desire to live in harmony with mm -hmm. the wild, mm -hmm. the huge desire to be part of it mm -hmm. and not be harmed by it. Mm -hmm. And so I hope, speculative, I don't actually know if it's possible. I mean, that's the big question, mm -hmm. is as we enter this state phase that we're in, and how we participate. <coughs> totally. You know, we have to give up even thinking about our own survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So here is something amazing. I just hope it isn't fantasy. Yeah. No, so, same. Yeah. I think it requires a lot more research and a lot more, um, yeah, I mean, dreams. I think it would be perfect for you to know somebody. Oh, mm -hmm. God. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, I mean, radiation, you know, beta radiation in particles, electrons. These can these aren't affected by that. They don't they interact with they only interact with the electromagnetic radiation, right? Ultra no. They will interact with the electrons? Yes. Yeah, so so part of um, neutrons and part of what we care about and, and we think about the role of melanin in our own skin. Um, we there's this band of radiation called ionizing radiation. And it's, it's roughly beyond, including a little bit of the ultraviolet. But kind of the way it works is just sort of tearing bonds apart. It'll, it'll uh, sort of interact with us and literally rip bonds in our DNA apart. So they charge, the freeze charged particles instead of being neutral to it. Exactly, yeah. Separate, can, separate ionizing because it literally ionizes us. It literally, it, knocks off electrons of our own body. And then when you have molecules, uh, organic compounds that are missing electrons, they might turn to their neighbor and bond incorrectly, or mm -hmm. they'll bond physically still, but they'll bond in a way that then becomes a, it's a new harmful radical in our body. But so, not only have scientists, like in that, in that paper on the headline I showed, not only have scientists figured out by now that it's not just ionizing radiation, but it is. It does include uh, the visible spectrum of radiation, even things like thermal heat radiation, and we don't have the best idea of, of, of these higher energy particles, higher energy radiation, but we have witnessed, and 
and uh, demonstrated that they will synthesize these these higher energy particles, which is actually quite insane because photosynthesis is very narrow. It's very, very limited to visible spectrum or ultraviolet light. But if we have this new thing, well, I mean, it's not new, it's <laughs> new to us, but if we have this new way, of, this new discovery, um, yeah, maybe we can, it may not be fantasy to, to actualize the reality with them. So are you saying like that UV C, exactly. don't see there's a real rapport with these organisms with that. They they environment. will consume. They will yeah. they will synthesize. Yeah. So plants are creating carbohydrates out of that synthesis. Right? What what are these guys generating? What's coming out of the other end of the process? That you know, they're using? They're growing. I mean it's carbohydrates. Yeah. It's sugar. They want sugar. That's what I put on the quilt. Like every, yeah, I mean, they're still, it's, they're carbohydrates. I don't know exactly, like, yeah, what the chemistry is, but they're carbohydrates. And I'll add that radiosynthesis is much like metabolism in our own bodies, metabolism of, of other organisms. There are no one metabolic pathways mm -hmm. in, in bodies and in, in this consumption, this m m metabolic process. So in the radiotropic process, for example, there are certainly many dozens at least, I would imagine, uh, metabolic pathways for processing mm -hmm. ultraviolet B, for processing thermal radiation, for processing higher energy radiation. Mm -hmm. Speculation for sure, I would guess. I mean, the chlorophyll is that the radiation actually knocks electrons and moves electrons, right? And that's, that's, that's okay. That starts a chemical reaction when you other starches. It you know, produces the structures when, they, when the electrons interact with other ingredients uh, in the plant itself. So, and, that's, and that's very similar. To, yeah. So that's happening with, instead of uh, chlorophyll, it's melanin that does it. Yeah, so essentially you can think of like, uh, the way I like to explain it is that um, it's, like, it's like you create a field that then a uh, molecule walks through and half of it stays on that side and half of it passes through because you're essentially creating a potential, like a, like a voltage of sorts that will separate them and allow more chemistry to occur. And that's, that's basically what... Uh, Have they done tap. examples of... I'm, I'm interested in working with ultraviolet light. So in the UV spectrum, where they have the UVA, and look, you look at the fungus, and it maybe doesn't change, but if it gets UVB and C, does it grow? Does, is there a color shift? What, is there anything to our eye that you can observe changes with the fungus itself? No. Yeah, but some of them, I mean, there's a whole, but I can show you some of them, because actually some also produce a red pigment. Um, I can show you pages of the fungarium. Because it, some of them have green, actually, like, they start out sort of green, and then with the exposure of radiation, they get darker. And that's, but that's not the same for all. I, Sasha and I did kind of a case study with six species, and we were never ex exposing anything to radiation because we didn't have, like, the means to do that. Um, and we're really, again, thinking about the myth of this as well. Um, and so, yeah, they're, but they're, like, Especially Cladosporium, and it's one of another species. Um, I can't remember the name. It starts with an S. Series. I don't know. That one really is like super green and light, and then becomes very dark in the presence of radiation. So I don't know. I mean, that would be an interesting thing. I'm sure there's some papers that might like talk about different types of radiation and the sort of relative color performance. Yeah. But it's producing melanin. That's that's the darkening that stuff, isn't it? Mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the is increasing, that's what mm -hmm. Yeah. Skin dark is, exactly. Skin dark is mm -hmm. And I think, I want to say, uh, I might have seen this in a paper or just read it briefly, but correct me if I'm wrong, but Clado, even this species, like depending on if the agar is made from oats or if it's made from corn, it may be greener, it may be pinker, yes. but at the end of the day, it will turn into 
uh, that right there, this this, this fungus on the, that's growing on the pedestal, will turn into this really dark uh, melanized fungi. Have you looked at regions like? I mean, I, I got this email from someone. Some talking about. Uh, where they were mining uranium where some of the native peoples were living mm. and the radiation got so high from just, I guess, the, the uranium being spreading on the ground and you know, probably careless mining. But, True. But, yeah, but they had to actually start moving tribes because of the high level of radiation. Mm. I wonder if in areas like that you would see some of these things that there would be a good area to study to see. It's quite possible. If these, the other thing question I had is, you know, how many years ago was it? Time is weird to me. But they had to close the library downtown because of that mold. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that the same mold or yeah, is it yeah, just like different species? I don't know what type of mold. I mean, again, it's all, there's like a number of black molds and that's just like their sort of uh, colloquial name. Um, I don't, yeah. I was assuming it all black mold was that. Mm -hmm. No. What did you say? And not all black mold is radiotropic. So yeah. there's like, there's, there's very, there's like, a, I think there's nine species that like we humans know about right now. There is one here that's exceedingly dangerous. Mm -hmm. I know some people get really sick. Yeah. It's never been cured in the journal. Yeah. Uh, isn't aspergillus a black mold? Uh -huh. And that is a very, very. But it's very also bad it's ubiquitous everywhere. It's the it's the primary fungus that goes into a compost pile. Mm -hmm. Aspergillus and trichoderma, and then and penicillium is also so what penicillin was synthesized from is um, also can be can has proven to be radiotropic. And these also like just to note that these are some of the most these are a classification to, I don't know classification is a dumb word but like they're a grouping of fungi that are extremophiles so they live in so many different situations they can live in like super salty environments they can live they're some of the only species that live in Antarctica they have I've worked on a project again with Table we United where we're looking at hexavalent chromium that Lanol has put into the regional aquifer near San Alfonso Pueblo. Not that that was your fault, but I just want you to <laughs> tell us that you were And some of the species that are like living in this um, in this bioreactor that they've sort of created are aspergillus and penicillium, and yet there hasn't been any studies on like what they're actually doing. Um, I just a side note, like that the in remediation and then you know like I when I started studying bioremediation I was like very interested in like the sexy fungi that were forming fruiting bodies and they like they're so visually fascinating and and like creating artworks with those I was I was just like so interested in and then you know the deeper I've gotten into processes of bio and microremediation it's obviously increasing <laughs> increasing or it's very obvious and increasingly evident that it's best to use the native fungi that are there on site. Like, who are the organisms that live here, that can survive here? Um, and a lot of those organisms are like the very, they're molds. They're fungi that are like basically invisible their entire life. They don't form fruiting bodies. They have like these little kind of spore packages that totally live underground. Um, so, in this work, I, I think like this is really elevating this very bizarre fungus that we literally see all the time. Um, you can, when you see a decaying leaf, it's probably got cladospora anum on it, and and like really kind of bringing them into our common vernacular that these are actually really important organisms that we really wouldn't be here without. Um, so, yeah. so I have a couple questions about fun fungus. So. The ch chip or chitin? Chitin. 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 Is that the same thing that insects yeah. use? Yes. So, okay, that's it. So, when did fungi establish as a family? Diverge, yeah. Um, there's all kinds of different, <laughs> there's a lot of different, uh, I think that like some like really hardcore mycologists are speculating that it was like 300 billion years ago. 300 billion? Yes. And other people say, I think like 200 million. So there's this huge, it's a very, uh, like, what's the word? It's, 
like there's conflict between some kind of scientists and, and honestly like the mycological community like I think uh, yeah the person one of the people who really taught me Peter McCoy um, who wrote the book Radical Mycology which is an awesome book um, he postulates that it's in the 300 million realm. so that means it predates animals and animals yes so it's very very ancient yes. probably yeah and, and actually, yeah. And then there are going to be those that are newer. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, totally. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, genetically, fungi, <laughs> fungi are also more cl closely related to animals than they are to plants. And which is why that if you get a fungal pathogen, um, that in our, it's very hard to treat in our bodies often because our, our genetics are very similar. And yeah, that like brings me into thinking about um, the last of us. <laughs> but I find it so interesting that fungi are using chitin as a structural element for insects. I mean, that's the main exoskeleton. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, it's a so, it's a primary building block. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, isn't but it's not a ball life for yeah, fingernails. So it's, it's, it's like a baby. It's a polymer. I mean, it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's protein. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, but so the big one was 14 million years ago. 14 million years ago. So it can't be 300 million. Where would that's that what, that that is what Peter says. It can't be because that's before the big bang. 300 million? Yeah. Maybe it's really old. No, it's still Maybe it's, I don't know, 3 million. It before the big bang. But it's really interesting. 3 million years. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. It's that nice thing. And that's really important to place it. It's before the big bang. Yes. And I mean, there's also, I don't think it wasn't for, I mean, also like the, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm not saying, I don't know all these things. No, it's just, no, it's really hard, but it's really interesting to know, to place it on the destruction. Because it's not before the Big Bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know, I don't know. It's definitely before us. Yeah, I mean, it's before us. Long before us. Long before animals. Is what some mycologists speculate, but... So yeah. There's not a lot of evidence. I mean, we found spores, um, like I said, like the dating back from the Cretaceous period, which I don't know the exact number. Of things, so do you think, I mean, I'm going to get a little bit out there a little bit. I mean, I know a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about the importance of fungi in life and life systems. And there's some sort of sense of a kind of intelligence in fungi somehow. I mean, obviously, it's no nervous system or anything, but I mean, what do you think about that? Is that just irrelevant to what you're doing? Or is that no, I think unquestionably, it's quite obvious that they're intelligent species. And I think that, again, there's a lot of research. I mean, that also like begs, you know, starts the question of just like, well, what do we define as intelligence? And we're creating. <laughs> We are postulating intelligence is essentially it's a human thing. We're basing all of our like understanding of intelligence based off of what we conceptualize. It's so clearly not. So actually. yeah, and it's not they're not behaving like us. Right. It's I mean there's like you know there's evidence I don't know I won't be able to like speak clearly to it but like of um, you know scientists studying language in um, intelligence in chimps. And that we're removing them, removing chimps from their well, from their environment. They they sort of know, and that's how they perform. That's how their body knows the world. We extract them from that place and put them into a sort of scientific situation, and say like, okay, if you use this tool, then we're going to call you intelligent. But the the animal is completely removed from its entire system, right? And it's also performing like. We're trying to fit it, we're pigeonholing it into like defining intelligence based off of what we think intelligence is. So when we, ex you know, just totally like expand that. And fungi are very, I mean, there is very strong evidence. I think there's really interesting papers. One that came out last year by an amazing scientist, Andrew Adamansky, um, that he's looking at his, one of his papers in 2018 was called Towards a Fungal Computer. Um, and then in 2022, he published work where he actually um, has started to create like a sort of Rosetta Stone um, with a machine learning system that's decoding the electrochemical signals 
um, that fungi, the different species of fungi are making. Um, so one very like basic example of what he's doing is like there's a mycelial mat and it's like growing in a petri dish, and he took a block of wood and hovered it above the organism, and it sends off these electrochemical spikes, the, the frequency. Um, and then if he takes the same dimensions and weight um, of like a piece of plastic and hovers it above, there's no signal, there's no activity. And he's found that there are a variety of different types of signals that are being produced with different elements, different food sources, different, and so, and he has created like, you know, it's all speculative, but he's kind of creating a lexicon of like, how could we learn what they're actually saying? Yeah. And of course, like through the work of Suzanne Samard and other, um, other mycologists and ecologists, they're looking at the sort of the mycorrhizal systems that are clearly helping trees delineate resources. Um, so that's, and that's like there's determinations that are happening. Um, there's also work the, that Paul Stamens did where he was looking at the armillary of um, the honey mushroom in the Cascade region in the Northwest and learning that this honey mushroom, which is one of the largest organisms on the planet, it's over five miles right. wide, was, was basically kind of doing checks and balance system with the forest. It was completely eradicating the forest, and it was sending those nutrients to a forest that was in need, five miles away. And, and that fungus is not always pathogenic, and it turned into a pathogenic, like part of its body behaved in a pathogenic way, and another part of its body was, was distributing those resources in a, in a mycorrhizal way. So they're constantly kind of, again, like those are, those are some pretty rigid classifications that we have been like, they're saprotrophic, meaning that they decay plants and trees, and then there's mutualistic, they're mycorrhizal, they're, they, they need each other, they need a plant to, to exchange carbon. And then there are molds, and there's like these whole kind of classifications that, again, like, we have decided that they're this way, but then when you see them in many different environments, they totally perform differently. And so again, like, I would argue that that's an intelligent sort of reading of the environment, that, that they're making deterministic um, moves, basically, depending on what's necessary. So, I mean, and that's not even tough to start talking about cordyceps, which is a yeah. species that, that evades, that invades insects and paralyzes them, yeah, yeah. and then takes over their body. Yeah, like, and actually like makes them crawl to the, the top of a tree right. as high up as possible so that it can spread its spores in the best possible conditions. So the question is, do you think fungi can make a choice? Yes. Oh. I, yes. Beyond its own survival. The choice yeah. beyond its own survival. Well, its own survival is completely, like fungi also are not, I don't know, I think, there, there's a whole host of organisms, of fungal organisms that are also like obviously super problematic to us, to humans, right, or to animals. Um, and that's not to like, you know, we're really embellishing like these cool things that they're doing, but they also do like things that are, you know, harmful or pathogenic or what, kill things. Um, but yeah, I think that like unquestionably, their fungi are perfect organ. They're like model organisms for showing us the essential nature of symbiosis. Yeah. And symbiosis obviously means so many things. There's pathogenic symbiosis, there's mutually beneficial symbiosis, there's many different types of symbiosis. It's not a ubiquitous term that always means like we're working together in partnership. But they're always intersectional. They're always working within each other. And so to keep themselves alive, they keep others alive. And to keep themselves alive, sometimes they kill other things. But then they're distributing those, those resources. Um, so yeah, it, it involves redefining what intelligence is. Yeah. Yeah. Look how long the human race, man, misunderstood other man. Yeah. Right? You know. Yeah. Or even redefining what death is. Yeah. So exactly. something right. that's killed and it's killed and that's bad. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. just yeah. being recycled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things like viruses aren't alive at all. Non-living infectious yeah, viruses. So, I, I mean, if you want to get into other others. Totally. I was thinking even, <laughs> to that, even back to this question of life and like, like that there's, like when and what is the first life? I mean, without a, without a viral infecting a bacteria, or a virus infecting a bacteria, that's how we got RNA, right? Like there's, like there's constantly these like inter interactions and infections that are.
totally a part of this other world that we have no idea about like yeah. infection. It's yeah. like, uh, you know. And that's how, like, because everything has viruses, right? Yeah. They're part of the DNA makeup. Yeah. 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 No, I know. I, I didn't. I just learned that viruses weren't, like, living things, and it was, like, were considered living. And I was like, what? That's so crazy. They're just these little, like, machines totally changing. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough game. Yeah, yeah definitely should not. Sure. I don't know. In the desert store, there's, and I wish I could remember the name of it, we used to see it. There's this one uh, organism that's actually a combination of a plant, fungi, and some human Is it a lichen or a cryptobiotic crust? Lichen. Well, it actually spreads out. It's one of the largest organisms in the world because it'll go from the Right. And if you, yeah. dig, if you dig into a desert, you yeah. see these little fibers. Do you, yeah. Do you, do you yeah, I think it's a cryptobiotic crust. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's really, really important, actually. That That's why they say don't step on Yeah, not possible. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, we would have to, we'd use the stream beds to travel mm -hmm. through these areas, so we were walking around yeah. the streets and destroying them. Yeah, those are really vital for Crypto. Crypto? Yeah, crypto crust. Crypto bionic crust. Mm -hmm. And it's like a it's a light, it's a large I don't know if it's a lichen but it's it's similar but there's bacteria um, and a, like an algae or like a plant and then a fungus there's kind of three. So I'm trying to understand your future work together. You what do you I don't, what do we do? Which we saw which was so great last year. Oh the at the current yes, yeah. um, but. What do you envision as two working as artists, scientists? Is it a question? Artists, artists? Artists, artists. You can go. Or I'm a. I'm a no, I think uh, so. So, um, you know, I'll speak to Caitlin's uh, long standing interest in cooperating, cooperating, collaborating with, uh, with uh, the realm of science directly. So, not just using materials from science. But actually, with educators, with scientists, uh, with people working in the fields, and um, there, one thing I didn't talk about, you know, kind of in my, you know, astrophysical work is uh, one of the most critical components that separates just a normal fluid like water from a space fluid, a plasma, is radiation. And radiation processes are ubiquitous in astrophysics. There are, I mean, you mentioned cosmic background radiation. Um, but so when Caitlin came to me to, to ask if I was interested in working on this project, um, we started from pretty much the ground up looking at papers. So we went directly to scientific research. Um, you know, she shared some research that she'd done with me. I shared some that I found um, to kind of expand our literature base. And we started thinking about a good beginning place, this, and long-term projects. And so I think it's of interest to us, uh, pretty immediate interest, if we're going to continue this sort of uh, narrative, is we have to put this thing under radiation. And to some extent, that means recreating experiments. And fortunately, these papers are written quite well, so um, it's uh, it's easy to fairly straightforward to reproduce. And when we actually go to make this into a wearable, for example, we actually do want to know, um, you know, different parts of the body. Uh, this is something of interest to Caitlin and I. She brought to my attention. Different parts of the body uh, absorb radiation differently. And different bodies. And different bodies, of course. Um, and not just that, but the way different parts of our bodies interact with radiation. Um, so we're more likely to get certain types of cancer from, from radiation. Skin cancer is an obvious one. Bone cancers, things like that. Um, your organs, your tissues, uh, these all behave differently. So we want to think about, um, yeah, is there, is there maybe, maybe an importance in where we put this wearable? Like, do we have to have a full cloak? Is it just better to wear a, you know, a leaded suit? Or, like, can we actually, uh, you know, 
incorporate these into more lightweight wearables. Uh, instead of wearing a leather suit, can we, can we wear a can we wear an inoculated raincoat? You know, uh, a poncho. Poncho. Yeah, totally. But but I th don't you think that it's also important? Like I can't tell. I can't tell. Mm -hmm whether you all are being ironic or perverse or actually see uh, or are looking for some kind of efficacy for that outcome. And it seems like, like every sentence is sort of a different position. And I personally think, because we have to work with both ethics and aesthetics, that you have to sort that out. Because to be actually being mm -hmm. ironic or perverse as a, as a parody of scientific research or some such is really different than to actually go work for the Department of Defense and making a bioprotective outfit out of this stuff. You know, it's a totally different aim. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of... Science fiction. Mm -hmm. Science fiction has fueled so many scientific discoveries. Yeah, and I don't think mechanism. I'm not really talking about the ethics. I would not say oh, the ethics, the ethics of, of the use of radiation. Or of no, as I said, are you are you trying to actually make something useful? Are you trying to make a, an oblique commentary about um, a, a, about something by an ironic positioning? You know, I wouldn't are say you using because there's tone. There's tone in what you're saying, and what is the tone telling us? Hmm. I yeah, that's interesting feedback. I mean, I wouldn't say that anything is ironic. I would yeah. say that it's either speculative. And I understand the sort of the variation in language, and I think the reason why Sasha and I kind of stopped with the idea of making clothes is because we ran into that, which is like this could be really problematic, and we don't actually want to, especially for the exhibition, and that was really a big exhibition in Ljubljana. Like we weren't, we didn't want to give anyone false information, mm -hmm. and um, yet we are reading these things as as like dreamers and as people who are but is it the cause of the cure? What, what are you dreaming about? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not dreaming about the cause, but I'm interested in the history. Um, and I don't think of myself as a person that's going to cure anything. I think of myself as an artist that brings um, conversation and potentiality to experiential <coughs> Artworks. You're creating an experience. Yeah, and sort of but right. I think with Shane, like getting Shane involved, I'm very interested in in testing this and seeing what's possible and starting that research. And again, like we've been doing, like Shane and I just started working, and you know we've been kind of sharing papers a little bit, but like for three months. And Sasha and I have been working together since 2020, but we started working on radiotropic research and. 2021 and just did that for a year like and we're just as we kind of go along with our research we're adapting and shifting in order to be ethical and to not provide information that is problematic um, which is why the whole radiotropic exhibition was completely grounded like our artist statement was written by a person from the future who was sharing sharing a possibility it was completely speculative the whole thing was grounded in mythology and speculation. And I definitely understand the tension, and I, I think that's why like, we want to experiment, experiment and research it. I think the speculative nature of like Donna Harwood has come up because of we can't quite grasp what we're going into as our future. And so it's worth putting energies into <coughs> speculation. You know, ethics is very important, but you can't get every angle down. So I think in order to move forward, it's really worth it to have speculation and speculative processes. <laughs> and I think ethics can be in that, you know, that you can't, you can't, uh, you know, predict every single outcome of what we're trying to. I would also, yeah, I would also just say really quickly. If without speculation, we have no advances in science, right? Right. That's what you're saying. I think the artist in a way, maybe that's the way I think about it. <coughs> from both, both areas, you know, physics and art. And the artist, I mean, I like to come up with ideas. The artist is not held to the constraints that the scientist is. So the artist can, in a lot of ways, do things or, or imagine things or create, create experiences out of things that the scientist will not get to for years. Cezanne, for instance, visualized 
curved spaces. If you look at his work, he's actually curving space because he's, he's not seeing the way a camera does. He's seeing the way we see. We move our eyes and the eyes move. So you know, he's looking around things and painting what he sees. And, but he anticipates Einstein's notion of curved spaces. Of course, he's going all the way back to 1860s and 70s where you have the mathematicians coming up with non-Euclidean spaces, curved spaces. That kind of frees him from the idea of the perspective space, the camera perspective. So that, but he was able to work with that idea because he didn't have the constraints that a physicist would have. You know? Eventually, when they can, when they find ways to break through the you know, new 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 methods, new techniques, new mathematical techniques, then they the, the scientists will catch up. The constraints are usually have this money. Mm -hmm. yeah. The constraints are usually have this money. <laughs> Not always, but there's certain uh, laws to you know, that we believe we know all the laws of nature, but we think we do, and you know those can be constraints until we see that some of these laws are just uh, approximations yeah. to what's yeah. really happening. I would also argue too, like, back onto this question of ethics, which is really important, and I do feel that that's a foundation of actually, yeah, doing just work, just like justice uh, to multi species. But I also think that, like, even to kind of yeah, um, like pivot off of what Anna was saying, in that ethics isn't also like they're not. I wouldn't say that this that fungi that we have the same ethics, right? Like, what are the ethics? Like, what is that? And who are the ethics that you know? Like, who is the ethical subject in mind that we're kind of looking at? And there's because there's we need to think about like beyond human, like beyond our species as the sort of like ethical foundation. Absolutely. But, but I was actually thinking not so much in terms of the transactional relationship of art and science, but really more like art and design. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about to what extent are you interested in applying this? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the application of this and the ethics of application, mm -hmm. I wasn't really thinking about okay. the speculative or the imaginative or okay. those ideas and the arts and the scientists and all that. Mm -hmm. I was really just thinking about, yeah, is this, is this, you, you showed a picture of an outfit. Yeah. Like, what is the status of that vision? Is that meant to be an applied functional thing? In which case, it's kind of perverse. Mm -hmm. Or is it meant to be a, uh, a problematic, mm -hmm. thought-provoking, okay. non-functional? Yeah, yeah. Is it operating the symbolic economy of art or in the practical side? Mm -hmm. Like, where are you saying? Yeah. So I, that's where the ethics come I don't, totally see, I don't that. see those as, as disparate at all. I, I think, didn't say we're desperate. I'm just no, 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 no. For us in yeah. our work, I, I think I think by pursuit of this sort of kind of absurd reality that was recently discovered. I mean, the, the process of radiosynthesis. Uh, you know, it is of active interest. NASA didn't spend money on this for no reason. And the idea, to me, as a scientist, that we would code that we would line spacecraft or satellites with fungi is absurd. It's, you know, in, 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 in the same provocative sense. Absurd I, meaning like unexpected, like you didn't see that coming. Perverse, unexpected, ridiculous, all of the aspects I, I have felt when like looking at some of this research. Even in some of the ways like some of the novel research that uh, Caitlin has provided with me, for example, the towards a fungal computer, uh, you know, I was sort of taken aback. I was like, in a way, this is incredibly creative, but ridiculous. Like, I couldn't, you know, as a scientist, not ridiculous. I don't know what the fungal computer looks like. It's the guy that I was talking about who kind of like, has to create. She, she was like, a code, yeah, like a, a like trying to decode the language of my yeah, dark. passing in the, in the, the in the sort of uh, like potential application of creating an environmental computer, meaning that like potentially there would be a, a a fungal organism that was like living within a forest, and it could signal to us if there was if it encountered lead contamination, for example, and so that like there would be which like again is absurd too because I also think that adamancy is. It's like the <laughs> my mycorrhizal and mycelial networks that are already on the planet are essentially a type of 
unconventional computer. Right. And so, like, he's kind of taking yeah, his convention. He's using the language. Totally. Of yeah. Of <laughs> yeah, he's kind of like bringing it exactly. He's bringing it into this human world. He's also just like so crazy and ridiculous and absurd. And he's like imagining all these really weird things, but then he's like starting to really study them and find crazy applications, and then also just finding really uh, yeah novel. And, and and to continue with that thought, as as a scientist too, like scientist artist, you know, being approached with this kind of uh, these kind of novel concepts that to me are at, at first I was like this is this is laughable. <laughs> this this to me is is like I don't want to exist in a in a scenario where we had to come up with an absolutely ridiculous. A solution to a problem that we created, you know, like much like the the hope that technology at the end of the day is going to come and save the the end of times due to climate change, for example. But the more I've spent time with this in 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 both the scientific and artistic setting, yeah, just by the way. But the more the more time I've, I've spent with the interface of these two things. Even, you know, how do we actually, can we actually make a full curtain out of that and like why? Mm -hmm. But in that process of thinking about this is absurd, but this actually requires legitimate research to like validate its existence as a biomaterial. Mm -hmm. uh, I realize that there are just discoveries that we have not made yet in our own process of researching radiotrophic fungi as uses of textiles. Mm -hmm. It might lead people to to want to research whether that's exactly what's happening. How does the melanin? How, how, how does how does it work with radiation? And actually develop a process mm -hmm. which may not depend on the fungi. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. One of the things I would say, and I think this is true for pure science too, is there's a universe of discourse. And you know, in other words, there's a new you of ideas that we all live in. Mm -hmm. And you're adding to it. Totally. You're adding to it. Now, where it goes, and this is the same, this is true for pure science, which I believe in. I believe we do too much applied science and not enough pure science. And all our effort tends to go for it. Oh, well, mathematicians would love to hear that. <laughs> mathematicians would love to hear that. Yes, yeah, so a lot of scientists do too. I mean, uh, C.P. Snow and some other people like that sure. all wrote about this. And, uh, uh, and the idea is that. You know, and I run into people and they say, well, I hate the fact that these universities are doing this, this research that has no practical application. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that, that you don't know that. I mean, people who were developing quantum mechanics back in the early part of the uh, 20th century, I mean, there was no practical application then. And now we have computers. Computers could not exist without our knowledge of quantum mechanics. Certainly. I mean, I mean most, of our, most of our technology exists because somebody was just trying to figure, mm -hmm. trying to understand something, like mm -hmm. fields, electromagnetic fields, Maxwell's equations, our whole electromagnetic uh, you know, uh, technology depends on that. If they hadn't done that back in the 8, 19th century, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any, any development that way. Now, whether you, you might say, well, is there really improvement? I, you know, that's, that's a matter of taste, I think. I think, you know. But you can also do more than one thing at a time. Yeah. You know, so you can, you know, can sort of scenario things no, out where you're understanding no, it on its own merits and then also speculating around the edges. I mean, you can yeah, do a lot of things in the situation. Yeah, there are people applying who are engineers and yeah. who are taking these ideas and trying to, you know, show yeah. them and making them work for something. Right. I just think it's useful to, to know which it is you're trying to do. What, what we're saying, yeah, or what we're thinking. I, I, I honestly, I mean, I would love to, I would love to make an outfit. I want and like I'm super interested because you want to make the outfit. Yeah, like the fungi have to be alive, which is another thing. I've done a lot of textiles with growing the city of my coda, like growing the ones that produce mushrooms, and they, like, yeah, the the textiles become super interesting, and you can like integrate them into clothing, but they're dead, and you like you sterilize them, you put them in the oven, and you, you sort of kill them. With these, they have to be living because they're metabolizing. So that's another like kind of just crazy thought. Like I have to keep if I was like wearing a fungal coat, I have to keep it alive. So then there's this other symbiotic relationship that's happening too. And like what would that even look like? Because actually this should be like completely black. 
This, from like my experience of growing fungi and the duration of time and also the type and like, but they're not receiving oxygen. We didn't put really any because we were worried about spores and stuff. So like they haven't really received any oxygen, so they're not growing. This basically looks exactly the same as it did. <laughs> Which I was like shocked. A little bit more. That's I was wondering like, about the radiation. Are we receiving the radiation? No, there's. I mean, there's a light. No, so there's no LED. LED. Well, that that's just an LED light. Yeah. Couldn't you have LED a LED light? light? We, we could. We have, could have, yeah. That, and we, we th that's exactly what we want to move into. Yeah, we, like, we we want to take these papers and they they grew these things in highly controlled environments. Mm -hmm. And we're here, you know, trying to uh, to frame together some Home Depot lumber with the Home, Home Depot light to try and make a display, hoping that it'll grow. And if it does, then we I check suggest it out. you make a closet with a humidifier. Yeah, but exactly. But so yeah. so yeah, in the future we we absolutely intend to to redo a lot of these steps now with UV lights and and recreate in, in some ways the the. So the research that's already out there. Use thermal heat sources and see if we can recreate it. What? I know, my legs are like kind of just around here. Can we look at the pedicels? Yes, totally. Yeah, those grew well. I don't know why. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for coming today.